Hi, I'm Dr. Kelly Smith. I'm a lung specialist for kids, and asthma education is my biggest passion. With asthma, the main problem that we'll talk about in a minute is inflammation in the airways. But really, in my opinion, asthma is about education and communication. Because once we get the education and the communication um, parts established, and you can understand why we're using the medicines that we're using and why we're asking you to do um, take the treatments that we ask you to take or for your child, um, it's a lot easier to understand. And once you understand something, it's a lot easier to control. The goal of asthma treatment is that you should need to use your rescue inhaler less than twice a week. You should have a nighttime cough less than twice a month. And you should need those oral steroids like prednisone um, less than once a year. If you're needing prednisone more than once or even twice a year, then something's not right and we need to improve your asthma control. With asthma, you should almost never be in the ER um, and you should almost never ever have to be in the hospital with extremely few exceptions. So those are some of the things that we want to focus on today and to let you as patients and as parents um, understand. So we're going to spend a few minutes, we're going to divide this up into chapters and talk about the different aspects of asthma and um, break it down in a way that's clear and easy to understand. First, um, I want to talk about some misconceptions. Most people, when they think of asthma, they think of what their friends had in high school or what they had as a kid when they were growing up. And they think of a kid sitting on the sideline with a puffer, with a spacer, not being able to keep up with their friends. That type of asthma shouldn't even really exist anymore. These days, if you have asthma, there's almost no reason you shouldn't be an Olympic athlete. If you have the God-given talent to be a gold medalist, and your asthma slows you down, then either I'm not doing my job giving you the right medicine or you're not doing your job taking it like you're supposed to, almost without exception. And that's obviously not the case for everybody, but um, that's the take home message and that's what we really want you to understand. We want you as parents and as patients to set your expectations much higher. When you're in PE or recess on the using, um, running with your friends and playing, you should be able to keep up with them without any problems. So we're gonna talk about those things today. One of the first things that we usually talk about um, with the parents or the patients is um, what asthma is. Uh, you can use the analogy that there's about 32 different flavors of asthma. When most people think about asthma, they think of what their friends had in high school, where they're sitting on a sideline with their puffer and they think, well, that's not my child. My kid's not doing that, so it can't be asthma. But the truth is there's many different types of asthma. And we'll talk about those in more detail in a minute. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to swelling and inflammation in the lower airways. Other questions parents ask is, you know, will my child ever outgrow asthma? About half the kids who are toddlers who have asthma outgrow it by the time they're age six. It's just hard for us to tell, it's actually impossible for us to tell which kids are gonna outgrow it and which ones aren't. But I don't want my kids or anyone else's kids taking more medicine than they absolutely need. And so as an asthma specialist and as your um, primary care physician will also tell you too, that they don't want um, their kids or your kids taking any more medicine than they absolutely need. So they're gonna work with you very closely to help decrease the amount of medicine that they're taking as much as possible so that you get the most benefit with the least amount of medicine and the least amount of side effects and risks. When people think of steroids, which is what we use to treat asthma, um, inhaled steroids that is. When people think of and hear the word steroids, they think of Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire and they think of you know steroids. But the truth is, with the inhaled steroids that we use, and uh, we'll talk about those more specifically in a few minutes, when you use those inhaled steroids, it's such a small microscopic dose that if you take a medium-sized dose of an inhaled steroid twice a day, every day for a year, you still get less steroid in your body in that year than you get in one day's worth of prednisone. So when you're here in the ER and you're needing prednisone for about five days, that's about five years worth of an average asthma controller medicine. So when parents come in like this and they say, I don't want my kids taking steroids, once they understand that, then they realize, well, the best thing to do is just to take a little bit of prevention medicine on a daily basis so that you don't need to take the, the prednisone hardly at all. That's one of the most important take-home factors for a lot of parents um, when we talk about asthma initially. The next couple of segments, we're going to focus on understanding what we call the pathophysiology of asthma, which is what happens medically in the lungs. We'll go into some detail with that so you can understand and see for yourself firsthand exactly um, what's going on, how these medicines are working. Then we're going to talk about the different medicines we use and why we use the medicines that we do. And then also we're going to talk about um, the early warning signs with asthma. 
one of the things that you'll see is that asthma attacks usually come on over two to three days. So I want to spend a lot of time talking about the early warning signs so that you can pick up on the asthma symptoms in their earliest stages because asthma is one of these things that if you nip it in the bud, it's easy to keep it under control. Once it gets out of control, it's a lot harder to get it back under control and you have to use a lot more medicines, which we don't want to do unless we have to. And then at the end, we're going to talk about triggers that can trigger your asthma, such as viruses, um, colds, of course, allergies, and things in the environment, such as cat dander, dust, cigarette smoke, and so forth. And then lastly, we'll give you resources that you can use for further education that you can seek out on your own. Now we're going to spend a few minutes talking about what asthma is, because once you understand it and how it affects the lungs, it's a lot easier to keep it under control. There's lots of different types of asthma, but no matter what kind of asthma you have, it almost always affects your small and your medium airways. And once you understand this concept, you can understand about 75 or 80 percent of what you really need to know to control asthma. So we're going to spend some time talking about this. So asthma of any kind affects your small and your medium airways. Normally, the walls of the airways are nice and thin, and the airway is nice and open, and it's really easy to get the air in and out. But with asthma of any kind, the main problem you get is lots of swelling and inflammation in the walls of the airway. And that makes the opening a lot smaller, so it's hard to get the air in, and it's especially hard to get the air out. And that's where a lot of the wheezing comes from. And when you have that swelling and inflammation, just like in your nose, when you get swelling and inflammation in your nose, you get lots of snot and mucus. Well, when you have lots of swelling and inflammation in the walls of your airway, you get lots of mucus there too, and that clogs up the airways even more. So that's two things that make it hard to breathe. And as if that's not enough, you also have these muscles on the outside that normally are nice and relaxed. But when you have lots of swelling and inflammation and redness and mucus going on, those muscles on top get real irritable and twitchy and they want to squeeze down and clamp off the airways even more. So when you give you or your child albuterol or Zopinex, those are your rescue medicines. And what they do is they relax those muscles. But that's all they do. It doesn't do anything at all for the swelling and inflammation and redness and mucus. And like we said earlier, that's where the main problem is. Because if it wasn't for that, those muscles on top wouldn't be so irritable and twitchy to begin with. So how do we treat that? Well, that's where the prevention medicines come in, like inhaled fluticasone or budesonide and a whole host of other medicines that we'll talk about in a minute. I don't want to spend too much talking about specific name brands because these medicines are obviously going to change year to year and over time. But the concept of controlling the asthma with the preventative medicine stays the same. So that's where these prevention medicines work. And the way it works is you inhale it and it lands here and it works here, but they don't work right away. It usually takes about two weeks for these inhaled steroids to kick in and about four to six weeks to get the full effect. And what happens during that time is your asthma goes from, your airways go from looking like this to more like this. And then when you get a cold or the flu or your allergies act up or something triggers your asthma, you're starting off here rather than starting off here. So you have a lot more room to work with before you start coughing and wheezing, getting chest tightness and shortness of breath. So asthma is all about prevention. It doesn't take a lot of medicine, just a little bit on a daily basis to keep it under control. So next I want to spend a few minutes talking about using these medicines the proper way. Because if you use the medicines with the right technique, they work much better and you get a lot more benefit from using the medicines. First, there's the nebulizer machine, which you can put the um, medicine inside of the um, nebulizer cup. And when you turn the machine on, it provides a mist that you can inhale into your lungs. In the old days, we actually thought the nebulizers worked best. But we know now that if you use a puffer with the spacer with the right technique, it works just as well or even better than a nebulizer. Um, but some people just really do better with the nebulizer machine. And so there's the, um, the mouthpiece that you put straight in your mouth. And then for younger children, there's um, fun little masks that you can use um, for the treatment as well. Next, let's talk about how to use a puffer with the spacer. In the old days, we thought that you would just put the puffer in your mouth, or we can use an open mouth technique, and that works very well. Um, the studies show that actually, if you use a puffer with a spacer, with the right technique, that it works just as well, or even better than a nebulizer. 
And a lot of times people say, or actually the studies show, that it works even better because it takes about two minutes for the medicine to get into your lungs instead of 10 or 15 that it does with the nebulizer. So how do you do it? Well, first, what you want to do is shake up your puffer for about 30 seconds or so. You can think of it like a spray paint can. The more you shake it, usually the better it works. So you shake it up for about 30 seconds, and you put it in the spacer, and then you puff, and then you take a big, slow, deep breath in over about three or four or five seconds, and then you hold your breath for 10 seconds, and that lets all the medicine land in your lungs, and then you breathe out. And then you blow out all the air, shake it up, puff, take a big, slow, deep breath in again, and hold it for 10 seconds, and let it out, and you're done. It's very important to breathe in slowly. And the reason why, um, and this is something that people um, um, are never educated about, so we're going to take a few minutes to really focus on this specifically. Um, the reason why you want to breathe in slowly is because when you push, push the puffer, the medicine comes out in these big fat droplets. And the spacer lets those big fat droplets turn into this fine mist. And that fine mist can get into the small parts of your lungs where the asthma is. So when you inhale the medicine, it has to go through the spacer and through your mouth, and when it gets to the back of your throat, it has to make a sharp 90 degree turn to get down in your lungs. If you breathe in too fast, the medicine's going so fast that what happens when it gets to that sharp corner? It all crashes in your throat, and then you swallow it, and it goes to your stomach, and you absorb it, and very little actually gets in your lungs. So for little kids, I tell them that it's like cars and trucks going down the road real fast, and if they go too fast, they all crash. So you have to breathe in slow, slowly so the medicine can make that sharp corner without crashing and then get into your lungs and, and like it's supposed to. Uh, some spacers, um, and the most common ones have this, have they, they have a little whistle mechanism on there. And it's not supposed to whistle. If you hear the whistle when you breathe in, it means you're breathing too fast. It means all the medicine's crashing in your throat. It means you, you need to slow down. I tell the little kids that um, that's a police officer's whistle. If you hear the whistle, that's a police officer telling you you're speeding. You have to slow down. So I'll demonstrate it once, um, um, just uh, for good measure. So you shake it up, puff. You shake it up, I'm sorry, either this way or this way, for about 30 seconds. And you puff, and then take a big, slow, deep breath in. Over three or four or five seconds, and hold it for 10 seconds. And let it out. Did you hear that whistle a little bit just then? That means I was breathing in a little bit too fast. I needed to slow down and do it again. So once you get the hang of it, it's actually very easy to use. Um, it just becomes a habit. So that's how you use a puffer with the spacer with the right technique. Um, there's other spacers that you can use. This is the most common type for when you're about age six or seven or above. For kids that are younger than six or seven and can't really take that big breath in and hold it, we use a spacer with a mask. These are some of the most common types. The um, orange one is for infants, um, babies that are in the NICU or um, really young. And we can use these spacers down to kids in the NICU. Then the other device, the, um, the deck size up that we use for toddlers and kids up to about age six or seven is one with the mask. And you can either use this one or you can use one of these that has a detachable mask. And the technique is slightly different. What you want to do is you shake it up um, for about 30 seconds, of course, and then you put it in here and you puff, and you have a nice tight seal on the child's face, and you let them breathe back and forth about six or eight times. And you'll see a little one-way valve right here move back and forth. And you'll see that valve move back and forth about six or eight times. And that's how you know they're getting the medicine in their lungs. And that's the first puff. And then you shake it up, puff, do it again, take another six or eight breaths, and you're done. Another type that I want to show you that is actually very popular, especially among teenagers, this one's actually called an OptiHaler. It doesn't, the study show, it doesn't work quite as well as the other ones, but it's very convenient because instead of using this L-shaped bracket and carrying, instead of carrying two things with you, this actually can fit inside and it can be stored like this and it can fit in your pocket or your gym bag very easily. The way that you use this one is you take it out and you put the canister here like so and it's really the same technique. You shake it up and you puff 
and take that big slow deep breath in and hold it 10 seconds and let it out and then repeat um, exactly the same technique. This one does not have a whistle on it, um, but I, I want to point this out because oftentimes teenagers especially don't want to carry a puffer and a spacer with them in their pocket or their purse or their gym bag. And we know that if you use a puffer by itself, it doesn't work nearly as well as with the spacer. So if you use this one, it's a lot easier to carry and um, it's easy to keep in your gym bag or at the school nurse for rescue. The other types of medicines that we have are called dry powder inhalers. Um, there's a couple of different types. These are just a few of them. There's the um, discus device that comes in um, different medicines. And then there's a turbuhaler device. The way that you use these is um, it's pretty simple to do. First you open it and then it has a little lever that you click to activate the medicine. And then basically you hold it like a hamburger and suck on it like a milkshake. Just take one big slow deep breath in and hold it 10 seconds and then let it out and you're done. So it's very simple, very easy to use, very easy to teach, um, especially for a primary care physician. Hold it like a hamburger, suck it out like a milkshake or a juice box or whatever your reference is. So briefly, I'd like to talk for just a minute or two about peak flow meters. We don't really use these very much anymore. Actually, we know that your symptoms change um, with asthma about two to three days before your peak flow um, numbers do. So we don't really even recommend doing this. In fact, we like to keep asthma treatment simple, as simple as possible. So this is something that we can usually leave off. However, some people can't perceive their symptoms. They can't tell that they're having chest tightness or shortness of breath, and they might not have any idea that they'll have to go to the emergency room later that day. So for those few patients, and they're actually pretty few and far between, for those patients, it's actually very important to use a peak flow meter. So we'll talk about it just briefly. What you want to do, or what it is rather, it's a piece of plastic that has a little sliding indicator in it, here or on here. And you take a really big breath in and you blast out as hard as you can, and the little indicator will slide um, up and down the tube. And where it stops, it tells you what your peak expiratory flow is for that at that moment. Your physician will help you put a sticker on here that says what your green zone is, what your yellow zone is, and what your red zone is. And then um, you can correlate that to your asthma action plan, and that'll tell you what treatments you're needing that day. Um, most importantly, for those patients who are the, the poor perceivers, it tells them that, you know, my asthma is bothering me a lot more today than I thought. I need to go um, see my doc doctor or, or I need to take my rescue treatments. But typically, um, for the vast majority of patients, these things are not necessary anymore. However, one thing that is extremely helpful is what we call pulmonary function testing or simple spirometry, which is something your physician may do in the office where they have you blow into a a special computer machine and that provides a lot more information and, and is actually recommended by the asthma guidelines. Um, in fact, um, these peak flow meters are not even recommended by the asthma guidelines anymore except for those patients who are the poor perceivers. One of the most important things you need to get from your physician is what's called an asthma action plan. And what it is, it's a piece of paper that can look like this or like this. There's lots of different ones out there. But what it is, is a piece of paper that says that what you should take every day to control your asthma, what you should do when your symptoms increase and you start to have coughing, chest tightness, wheezing, and so forth, and then what to do when you have severe symptoms and when to go to the urgent care clinic or the emergency room. So first we're going to talk about <clears throat> the prevention plan. Some people call it the green zone. And these are the medicines you take um, typically twice a day, every day, rain or shine, no matter what, till you and your physician sit down and talk about it otherwise. While you're in the green zone, you should be running and playing full speed, keep, keeping up with your friends, having completely normal activity levels and so forth. You need to watch for the very early warning signs while you're in this zone because usually asthma attacks come on over two to three days. One of the biggest problems people make is they don't realize or recognize the very early warning signs and they wait till their symptoms are very severe to, to start treating them. And at that point, it's too late. The horse is out of the barn, so to speak. You have to use a lot more medicine to get it back under control. So 
one of the most important things you can do is focus on the very early warning signs. And that is, um, you'll start to feel like you're starting to come down with the cold, or maybe your allergies are starting to act up. You can't always put your finger on it, but you can just tell that there's something going on, something's not quite right. That's the very, those are the very early warning signs. You might have a stuffy or runny nose, nighttime cough, itchy, scratchy, watery eyes or throat, or if you use a peak flow meter, your peak flow meter might be a little bit lower. You don't have to take your rescue medicines then, but I want you to pay really close attention because usually over the next day or two is when you'll start to have more symptoms like coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, and that's when you want to jump on it right away and use your rescue medicine, which is the albuterol or the Zopinex. And you can use the puffer with the spacer, two to four puffs every two to four hours as needed. That's typically what we do. Your doctor might tell you otherwise, but something along those lines. Or you can use the rescue medicine and the nebulizer every two to four hours or so as needed for your symptoms. Typically, if your symptoms are going on for more than 24 to 48 hours, or if they're getting worse and not better, that's when you need to seek treatment and talk to your physician and see what else um, he or she recommends that you do to get this under control. Typically, at that point is when you um, want to ask your physician that whether it's time to start the oral steroids or not. That's the rescue plan. That's the yellow zone that we often talk about. Then the last zone is what some people call the red zone or the emergency zone. At that point, if you, you might have a really hard time breathing, trouble talking or walking, or you might not even be able to com, um, talk in complete sentences. You might have constant coughing, your lips or nails turn, might be turning blue, you might have constant wheezing. If that happens, uh, do not pass go, go straight to the ER or call 911. That's when you definitely, definitely need emergency treatment. The plan, though, is to stay in the green zone as much as possible, and when your symptoms start to act up, to nip it in the bud so that you never get to the red zone. And, and that's what asthma control is really all about, knowing what symptoms to watch for early, how to nip them in the bud before they get out of control, and um, how to get back in the green zone as quickly as possible. You need to talk to your physician about your own individual asthma action plan. These are general references that I've been making. This is generally what most physicians do, but every patient's unique and every doctor-patient relationship is unique. And um, need, I encourage you to talk with your physician and ask him um, to give you an asthma action plan that you can have. Um, I recommend that you keep it on your refrigerator so that everyone knows where it is. Um, often it's important to have several copies, one for your refrigerator, one for um, you know, mom's purse, um, one for the school, one for grandma's refrigerator, so everyone's on the same page. My name is Diane Rhodes, and I'm a registered respiratory therapist and a certified asthma educator. I work for Northeast Independent School District, which is a school district here in San Antonio. The things I'm going to talk to you today is about how the environment plays a critical role in asthma management. Dr. Smith talked earlier about asthma. The environment plays a key role in asthma development. When you look at asthma management, it's medication as well as reducing the known environmental triggers. So what's a trigger? A trigger is anything that's inhaled that can be a particle, a gas, a chemical, a biological agent, anything that's inhaled that can actually make the asthma symptoms worse because they make the asthma, the inflammation process to begin or to sustain itself. So you've got to look at everything around you environmentally that we're breathing in. And when you look at trigger management of those common triggers, I hope that what you get out of this, this presentation is understanding some easy steps that you can do at home um, to reduce those triggers, reduce the source of where asthma triggers may come from, and so that you can effectively help manage um, asthma by not only doing the medication piece, but also doing the environmental piece. I'm going to focus on the environmental interventions. Where are the triggers? Where are they found? Well, outside. As you know, we've got ozone, we have allergens, we have mold, we have pollution, and we have particles that are outside. And so 
that stuff's outside and there's not a whole lot we can do about it other than some basic strategies of avoidance. But let's talk about inside. Because we spend close to 90% of our day inside. So when you look at the full circle of asthma and you look at those environmental pieces, you have to pay attention to the outside, yes. But the bulk of our time is spent indoors. And so we really need to focus on where we spend the most amount of our time. That's at home, it's at work, and it's at school. Now one of the things that I do for the Northeast Independent School District is we look at the school environment and we make sure that we're making our environment as asthma friendly as possible. So we do some things to take care of that. But the focus of this presentation is so you can figure out what to do in your own home. When you look at this slide, this picture here, I want you to see the particles that are floating in the air. All those particles are inhaled. Now there are the particles you can see, the nose takes care of. The nose filters them and the nose traps them and we don't inhale them. But those smaller particles that you can't see are the ones that we inhale and they go directly into the airway. So what's, what's in those particles? Well, if you were to look at those particles microscopically, you would see dust, you would see dust mites, you would see cat dander, you would see pollens, you would see mold spores, you would see what we call VOCs, volatile organic compounds, which are irritants, secondhand smoke. All those things we inhale. They bypass the nose and they go straight into the airway. So you can kind of see how those things can lead to the inflammation I talked about earlier. Now secondhand smoke is an irritant. When someone smokes, you see the smoke, but there's a multitude of smaller particles that we don't even see. So secondhand smoke is critical in asthma management. And we should avoid that at all costs, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a little bit. The volatile organic compounds emit ultrafine particles. And those are even smaller sometimes than the pollens and the cockroach proteins that may be floating in the air. Those VOCs are actually emitted from things like pesticides, fragrances, cleaning products, pressed wood, chemical products, and again those all go into the airways as ultrafine particles. Those are called irritants because they don't create an allergic response. They just go straight into the airway and irritate the lining of the airway, which causes the twitchy airways in asthmatic. Now we know we cannot eliminate all the triggers. We, there's no way. And we certainly don't want to put our asthmatics in a plastic bubble because they need to enjoy life. They need to make sure that they are living a, an active life involved in many things. They can't just sit at home and do nothing. We want to um, give you ideas of how to manage that environmental component. One of the things that I use at Northeast Independent School District is this, is this graphic called Symptom Threshold. You see at the top, you'll see the dotted line that so shows Symptom Threshold. And if you look at situation one, you can see that you've got allergens and you have irritants. And those are those things that we can't control everything. So we're always going to be exposed to some allergens. We're always going to be exposed to some irritants. But as long as we stay below that Symptom Threshold line, we won't need the use of our albuterol for PRN usage. We, we won't have symptoms and we won't need to take that inhaler. But look at situation two. With added allergens, we are now crossing our symptom threshold line and now we're having symptoms. Okay, so that's an allergic kind of response to meet, meeting our symptom threshold and now having symptoms. Situation three, We've got irritants and we've got infection, but now we have an upper respiratory infection and that has put us over the symptom threshold. So the goal for all this environmental management piece is situation four. Let's reduce the triggers that we can reduce. Let's reduce the amount of allergens we can exp be exposed to. Let's reduce the irritants that we have some control over. So that even if we get that upper respiratory infection, we don't hit our symptom threshold. 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the rest of this conversation telling you how you can get to situation four. Let's reduce some of those allergens. Let's reduce some of those irritants that are commonly found in our own home. There are five simple steps you can take in assessing your home. These five things, if you do these five things, you will eliminate a lot of the sources of where allergens and irritants come from. Those five steps are the house needs to be dry. The house needs to be clean. The house needs to be comfortable. You need to control the amount of pollutants in the home and you need fresh air. If you remember those five simple things, you can drastically reduce the amount of allergens and irritants in the home setting. So let's talk a little bit about each one. A dry home. Mold, dust mites, and VOCs thrive in humid conditions. Mold develops with high humidity. We can be outside and know that we've got mold issues in San Antonio. But inside the home, you do not want humid conditions. So we want to look for leaks, water intrusion, wet building materials. Check under the sinks, check around the shower area, and in the washer dryer area. And make sure you don't have water coming into your, into your inside environment. Cleanliness. Your home needs to be clean. We don't need to clean for looks. We need to clean for health. And so the way to clean for health is basically get rid of dust. You can use microfiber cloths that capture the dust. Damp cloth wiping removes the dust. Because all those allergens, even outside allergens, can be found in indoor dust. Pollens are in there. Cockroach droppings are in there. Um, cat dander is in dust. So you need to remove the dust. You also need to remove clutter so that you can easily dust. And so if you have a home that has a lot of things that you really don't need and you can't effectively dust, that's one key place you can start. Eliminate the clutter so you can actually dust your inside environment. Homes need to have a relative humidity between 30 and 50 percent. And the comfort level is pretty much described by the relative humidity. And relative humidity is basically how much water is in the air. By having relative humidity below 60, you impede mold growth, you impede dust mite population growth. And like I mentioned earlier, that humidity level is, makes VOCs even stronger. So you want a comfortable home with a relative humidity between 30 and 50 percent. Control pollution. Anything you bring into the home, you need to evaluate if it's going to be emitting an odor or a scent or particles or VOCs. Avoid aerosol sprays. Avoid anything that has um, a fragrance to it because you're basically adding pollution into the indoor air. Also be mindful of new products, new, that new product smell, that new carpet. It has a smell. New furniture has a smell. Because all those smells are actually emitting those volatile organic compounds that I talked about earlier that we inhale directly into our airways. If you bring in a new product, think about, hmm, we were fine before we brought in this new carpeting. And I thought new carpeting was supposed to be better than the old carpeting. And it probably is. But now it's emitting a VOC that's actually irritating the airway. So just be mindful of those things that you bring into your home that have smells and scents and aerosol sprays. That also includes any chemical cleaning products, room deodorizers, sprays. All those things can help you meet your symptom threshold in that irritant category that we talked about earlier. Fresh air. Fresh air is ventilation. And ventilation is necessary to basically move the air so that the air conditioning can filter the particles that are floating in the air, but it also dilutes the bad air, the, the used air. It dilutes that air to make it healthier. So it's real important to have proper ventilation. Houses are sealed 
So you're really relying on your HVAC, your, your air conditioning system, to properly filter the air and move the air. So you've got to make sure the fan is working correctly to move that air through. And if you don't have central air conditioning, you need to make sure that you open the windows on occasion. Now, obviously, you don't want to open your windows during a high pollen day because then you're allowing pollens in. So that's that understanding your environmental triggers to know what your body can handle and what your body can't handle. So those five things, five simple steps. The house needs to be dry. It needs to be clean. It needs to be comfortable needs to eliminate any pollutants that you may be bringing into the home, and you need fresh air. Now let's talk specifically about a few common asthma triggers and some simple ways to avoid them. Dust. Dust is microscopic, and the dust mite actually produces, it's a, it reproduces, and it feeds on human skin cells. So when you're looking at strategizing in your home environment on dust, I would start with the bedroom. Because dust, the dust mites are in the mattresses, and they're in the pillows, and they're in the bedding. They're also in carpeting, they're in stuffed animals, they're in anything upholstered. And that's where the dust mites burrow in, they reproduce, and it's actually um, the, the fecal material and the body parts is what the allergic reaction is caused by. So the solution is eliminate upholstered furniture that you don't necessarily need. Uh, if you have the option to remove, if you have a choice between carpet and tile, I would go with tile. On the bedding, you have to make sure you wash the bedding in hot water. That's the only thing that kills the dust mite, and that's a temperature of 130 degrees. Dehumidify your home if you find that your home has a lot of humidity, because as you dehumidify, um, you reduce the amount of risk for mold, but you also impede the dust mite reproduction. So if you do have a humid environment and you need a dehumidifier, I would definitely start in the bedroom because the bedroom is where you have the most reservoirs for dust mites to embed and reproduce. And they love relative humidity and they love temperatures that we love. So when you think about it, you get in bed and you're under your covers, you are emitting heat, you're emitting moisture, and that's a prime source for dust mites to inhabit and reproduce. Pets. Let's limit the amount of exposure to the pet and let's certainly not bring the pet into the bedroom and into the bed because those dust mites feed off of their skin cells as well. Secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke is proven to make asthma symptoms worse. So if you have to smoke, you definitely do not smoke inside the house, in the car, or in any attached garage. You go outside, you actually put something over you so that when you are smoking outside, that outer garment is absorbing most of the smoke smell and the smoke particles, and then you leave that outside so when you return into the home, you're not carrying all those particles on your clothing. VOCs, toss any unneeded chemicals. Do an inventory of what's in your home. Make sure you don't have plug-ins and air fresheners and potpourri and all those smelly things that make a house seem uh, pleasant actually can be making asthma symptoms worse. No chemicals, no fragrances, no perfumes. You shouldn't smell anything. Pollens. As I mentioned, close the windows during allergy season. But also, you have to realize we bring pollen in on our shoes. Because the pollen's out in the grass, we walk through the grass and we bring it in our shoes. So have walk-off mats, which is basically some, some throw rugs where you can take four steps as you walk into the home and that carpet will capture those pollens on your shoes. Or develop a no-shoe policy. You kick your shoes off at the front door. And so you're not bringing those pollens into the home. Pesticides. Be proactive in integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is basically strategies to A, take away the attractiveness of pests coming into your home. And the other part of integrated pest management is not using chemicals to eliminate the pests. So clean your counter, empty your trash, seal any open containers of food on those counters. Make sure that, that, that you don't have an environment where you're inviting pests to come in. Mold. 
mold needs moisture to grow. If your house is dry and you have low relative humidity, you won't grow mold. But any time that you have water in your home, you have to be diligent on making sure that it dries out quickly. So if you have a water intrusion event, it should be dry within 24 hours. If it's on carpeting, you need to make sure that you are drying that carpet completely. Don't just let it dry by itself because mold will grow in that foam padding underneath carpeting. So if you had a, a water intrusion event or the sink overflows and your carpet gets wet, you need to have fans on that dryer. You need to pull up the carpet so that you can completely dry that entire carpeted area that got wet. These are just a few of the things I've highlighted. There's a number of resources where you could go in and really look at more information on asthma management, trigger control, and reduction. I hope that the things that I've given you have been simple steps that you can just take in your home to kind of reduce the most common asthma triggers. But again, those five simple steps at the beginning, if you do those five simple things, you eliminate a lot of the reason, a lot of the sources that these triggers come from. I hope that you understand that asthma management is medication and making sure you take your medications correctly and your techniques are, are the way they're supposed to be, but you also realize the importance of the environmental piece. And again, what we're trying to get to is situation four where we can eliminate those allergens and irritants that we actually have some control over, be able to strategize a little bit better on how you can make your home as healthy as possible for your child with asthma.